The story begins with a series of sorrowful events entwined in the downfall of the imperial, the Hadelamid dynasty. Most regretfully, the root cause behind it all was treacherous betrayal. Sooner or later. This was bound to occur as the homunculus system had long been in need of reformation. Our youthful protagonist, one of the princesses, comprehended the significance of such a measure. The entire predicament resided within the structure of the forbidden alchemy known as homunculus, employed to establish absolute monarchy within the empire. In simple terms, it was a specially crafted army of soldiers meticulously trained and subsequently dispatched to the most perilous battles under the pretense of achieving prosperity and peace in the land. There were those who, by virtue of their exceptional skills, were elevated to the rank of knights. Such homunculi received due recognition and enjoyed amiable relations. However, despite this, they were indistinguishable from mere slaves within the system. It was inevitable for someone to nurture resentment towards the ruling dynasty, and so it came to pass. Moreover, individuals continued to stoke the flames of animosity, which eventually sparked the embers of rebellion. While King Desmond disregarded the looming danger, Bridget, the third princess who had become the official heiress, only exacerbated the state of affairs. After her coronation, she intensified the exploitation of slaves. As a result, many homunculi serving on long-term missions fell slain in perilous battles or perished grievously from insurmountable labor. Those among them who served at the palace found themselves in Bridget's harem where their knightly dignity was utterly trampled upon. Our heroine gazed upon all that her sister had done with sorrow. Eventually, unable to restrain herself any longer, she began scouring historical books for instances that bore witness to the official disinheritance of throne heirs. Bridget, in turn, leveraging her power, attempted to force the young princess into a politically arranged marriage. Everything was already being prepared for it. However, her plans did not succeed in reaching fruition. Michaelis Agneto was the monarch of the homunculi. In a short span of time, he assembled all the palace knights and incited a rebellion. The man himself possessed remarkable leadership abilities, and his mind was not clouded by the might of the imperial family. Michaelis decapitated the emperor and became the new ruler of the empire, immediately issuing his first bloodthirsty decree. The entire imperial family perished instantly, except for the seventh princess, even Rose Choel Hadelamid, and Rose Knight Hadelamid. Even Rose had been imprisoned in a separate chamber for a month already. She awaited her moment and understood that Rose Knight would soon be the sole remaining member of the entire family. Someone among them must have remained alive for the sake of the Philosopher's Stone, which was a symbol of imperial power and responded only to the blood of the most imperial individuals. Rose Knight was deeply in love with Michaelis, and moreover, he was her personal knight. Therefore, for even Rose, the choice of a new king was evident. The young woman contemplated the inevitable future in her thoughts and gradually prepared herself for the end. Suddenly, an unexpected visitor entered her chamber. It was none other than even Rose Agnito himself, the young ruler who had come to visit the seventh princess. However, she was not inclined to engage in polite conversation with him. In her eyes, he was a true usurper. The new king did not hold any anger towards even Rose's behavior. He simply leaned over the maiden and remarked that she should have chosen him. The young woman looked at the man inquisitively. And Michaelis continued, stating that if she had chosen him as her personal knight, she would not be awaiting a death sentence. Members of the imperial family would select a homunculus who would serve them faithfully throughout their lives with unwavering loyalty. However, within this seemingly flawless system, there were underlying mercenary and bloodthirsty interests from certain members of the ruling family. Due to this reason, even Rose did not adhere to the family traditions and vehemently opposed such a system. Having analyzed Michaelis's words, the princess concluded that he was not only a remarkable ruler, but also a discerning strategist. The new king could only marvel at her deliberations and, referring to her as a woman of complexity, hastily departed from the chamber. At that moment, his subordinates approached him, delivering the news that all was not well with the child within the empress's womb. 
Even Rose involuntarily overheard this revelation, leaving her deeply astonished. As a farewell, Mykeles assured the princess that they would meet again soon. Those words sent shivers down the maiden's spine. Now left alone in solitude, she understood that those words most likely signified her imminent demise in the near future. Unexpectedly, another visitor entered even Rose's chamber. It was Rose Knight, her younger sister. The eighth princess was noticeably pregnant. The sisters greeted each other warmly. The delicate condition of the young maiden came as a surprise to even Rose. Rose Knight informed her that she was carrying Mykeles' child. Even Rose knew for certain that homunculi were devoid of reproductive functions. The maiden fell into contemplation and cast an inquisitive gaze upon her sister. It was then that Rose Knight explained that, in their situation, the power of the philosopher's stone had likely aided them. Furthermore, the sister informed even Rose that she had come to bid her farewell, for she had learned that today was the day of her execution. Additionally, with a smile on her face, Rose Knight revealed to even Rose that each member of the imperial family had been slain by their own personal knights, thereby avenging years of humiliation and cruel treatment. The sister stated that even Rose too awaited a cruel death at the hands of the one who desired her demise the most. She disclosed that such authority had been granted to none other than Mykeles himself. The maiden found it inconceivable. It seemed that Mykeles held a profound and intense hatred for her, surpassing all others. Even Rose searched introspectively for the cause behind such intense animosity. Rose Knight, perceiving her sister's distress and agony, sardonically affirmed that it was Mykeles who despised her the most. Even after these words, Rose Knight continued, proposing to disclose the intricacies of even Rose's impending execution. However, even Rose vehemently refused to entertain the details of her imminent demise. Undeterred, Rose Knight began revealing that she would be decapitated in the most bestial manner, one that involved multiple merciless blows from a blunt axe, prolonging her suffering. Even Rose quivered with fear. Then, Rose Knight retrieved a toxic bottle and extended it deftly to her sister, smiling as she disclosed that it contained belladonna venom, which would bring a swift and painless death. Grateful for her sister's assistance, even Rose accepted the bottle. They engaged in a brief conversation and bid farewell. However, Rose Knight lingered, wanting to ensure that even Rose consumed the poison. When even Rose inquired about her sister's lingering presence, Rose Knight smiled and cryptically replied that someone should commemorate her final sigh. With a swift motion, Rose Knight uncorked the vial and demanded that even Rose drink its contents immediately. Consumed by fear and awaiting her execution, even Rose took the flask and quickly drank the poison. Life began to slip away from her. At that moment, Rose Knight proclaimed that Belladonna, in the language of flowers, signifies I curse you. Seizing the opportunity, Rose Knight revealed her true intentions. Gleefully informing her dying sister that both Mykeles and the throne now belonged solely to her. Rose Knight thanked even Rose for her swift demise and, deeming her foolish, departed from the chamber. Soon, Mykeles discovered even Rose's lifeless body, deeply saddened by the news. He demanded explanations from the servants. Rose Knight stepped forward to clarify, claiming that her sister had taken her own life, assuming responsibility as a member of the imperial family and accepting the consequences. When Mykeles inquired how Rose Knight knew all the details, she replied that she had witnessed everything with her own eyes. The man questioned whether she had provided the poison to her sister. Without a trace of remorse, Rose Knight confessed to assisting her sister in finding repentance and departing from life. As Rose Knight attempted to offer further explanations, Mykeles commanded her to remain silent. In front of everyone's eyes, he lifted even Rose's lifeless body in his arms and headed towards the exit. Rose Knight's anger flared, and she reproached and admonished Mykeles. She even reminded him of their shared child. However, Mykeles smiled at Rose Knight and remarked that she was confusing an experiment with pregnancy. In response to her numerous questions, Mykeles simply explained that he had attempted to obtain the Philosopher's Stone by any means necessary, including blending their bloodlines to create an offspring. 
Rose Knight emphasized the inevitable fact of his parenthood, but Michaelis revealed that the true nature of the child was unknown since it was an experiment. It remained uncertain whether a monster or a human would be born. While Rose Knight was in a frenzy, consumed by her anger, Michaelis, overwhelmed by deep sorrow, carried even Rose's lifeless body in his arms. Subsequently, he summoned his advisor and conveyed the urgent need to revive even Rose by any means necessary. As it turned out, the seventh princess of the empire, even Rose, was celebrated among the homunculi. She always demanded better treatment for the soldiers and refused to adhere to the family traditions associated with them. This drew the scorn of her family, but at the same time, every homunculus dreamed of becoming her personal knight. Even Rose remained unwavering in her principles, capturing the attention of Michaelis. He observed her behavior, how she stood up for the soldiers, and exhibited kindness. Gradually, he realized that he had developed deep feelings for even Rose. However, Michaelis also understood that the bond between a member of the imperial family and a homunculus was an unattainable dream. Furthermore, a political marriage loomed ahead for even Rose. Upon hearing that she was soon to embark on a journey to a distant land to meet her future husband, Michaelis resolved to thwart this fateful decision and seize the imperial palace. He believed it was the only opportunity to keep even Rose close to him. But he wasn't the only one with such thoughts. Days have passed since fate unexpectedly intervened in Michaelis' plans. He has been by even Rose's side the entire time, neglecting all state affairs. He hoped that the Philosopher's Stone would work its miracle, but it required the blood of a Hielamid family member. Michaelis demanded that Rose Knight be brought to him, desiring her execution to use her blood for the stone. His advisor attempted to dissuade him, but Michaelis refused to listen to any arguments. Suffering greatly from the loss of even Rose, Michaelis felt that nothing held any meaning anymore. Suddenly, he received news that a sage had arrived from the spruce forest. This sage was said to know a method to revive the princess. Michaelis asked the sage directly what needed to be done. However, the sage warned that despite his willingness to fulfill the request, he must forewarn Michaelis that even Rose's soul had already detached from her body and dissipated. No alchemy or magic could resurrect her. But the sage proposed an alternative solution, to turn back time. This proposition intrigued Michaelis, although the sage warned that it would come at a great cost. Half of the philosopher's stone would be required for this method. Michaelis, desperate to bring even Rose back, was willing to pay any price. The man accepted his response and went to prepare for the ritual. During the preparations, the sage added another consequence. He explained that no one would remember anything of what had transpired, except for even Rose herself. Michaelis was prepared even for that. Hoping for a singular chance to encounter even Rose in a new twist of fate, none of them knew how events would change or if the script of their lives would be altered at all, but the decision had been made, and the ritual began. Michaelis swept even Rose's lips with his own in a farewell gesture, and as he did, he uttered the condition, upon her resurrection, she would either choose him as her personal knight or kill him. As time slowly revolved, all past events filled the corners of even Rose's memory. Initially blurry, they transformed into vivid scenes. Now, she understood the trap she had fallen into. She grasped her sister's disposition and comprehended Michaelis' intentions. Even Rose tried to fathom when her father had lost control over the homunculi and weakened his stance. It remained a mystery to her how Bridget had become the crown princess. She questioned if the catastrophe could have been averted by altering the imperial family's attitude towards the homunculi. Most importantly, she wondered if she could have positively influenced the course of events if given a second chance. These thoughts swirled in her mind. The ritual concluded, and time rewound. It was now a sunlit morning of a new day. Even Rose awakened and opened her eyes. As she sat up, she listened intently to the birdsong. Unexpectedly, she realized that she was alive. She had become a princess who remembered the traitorous events. Even Rose rose from the bed, walked around the room, and tried to comprehend her current whereabouts. She vividly recalled her imprisonment. 
how Rose Knight had come to her and offered a poisonous treat, and then darkness prevailed. Now, even Rose found herself in a bedroom that was meant to be in ruins. The princess touched the books and other objects, understanding that it was not a dream or an illusion. She approached the mirror. But what she saw reflected back at her frightened her. Before her stood herself, but significantly younger than her former self. Even Rose realized that she had returned to the past. For a moment, she thought she had gone mad from her prolonged captivity. After further reflection, she concluded that only a sage possessing the highest level of magical alchemy could have performed such a feat the young woman could hardly believe what was happening to her. She greatly desired to meet her teacher and discuss everything with him. However, for starters, it was necessary to calm down and carefully contemplate everything. It turned out that she was now around 20 years old. This meant that the third princess, Bridget, had not yet become the crown princess, and Mykeles Agneto and her sister, Rose Knight, had not even met each other. From these considerations, even Rose deduced that the youthful princess, armed with knowledge of all the events to come, found herself at the beginning of their unfolding. However, this time, she was determined to behave entirely differently for the sake of all. She resolved to become the crown princess and alter the course of destiny, as she knows that she will be fated to be dead once again if she is unable to make such changes in this chance once again. Interrupting her musings, a knock on the door brought even Rose's personal maid, Sedella Arfell, into the room. Sedella brought the morning tea for her mistress, and when even Rose saw the rejuvenated maid, she couldn't help but pay her a compliment. She soon realized that her journey back to the past was the reason behind Sedella's transformation. Curious about the specific time she had returned to, even Rose inquired about the upcoming events in the coming days. Sedella informed her about the 20th birthday celebration planned for the 8th princess, Rose Knight. Deep in thought, even Rose, now 21 years old and rejuvenated by 8 years, couldn't contain her smile at the conclusions that pleased her. Sedella reminded her that the 20th birthday anniversary was a special date for the imperial family. As it marked the day the birthday girl had to choose a personal night from the homunculi. It was not merely a ritual, a pledge was uttered, and a special bond was forged on a spiritual level. Sedella mentioned that many homunculi were vying for the role of Princess Rosanite's personal knight, referring to her as the White Rose of the Empire. Even Rose thought to herself that Rose Knight was indeed the deadly nightshade of the Empire. But by no means a rose, let alone white. Sedella also mentioned that rumors circulated about the previous selection of the Eighth Princess. The main contender for the role of her personal knight was an extraordinary homunculus named Sylvestian Millard, distinguished by his silver hair. He was a skilled warrior proficient in swordsmanship and magic, standing out from others in appearance. Even Rose knew that Rose Knight would choose Sylvestian, but she also knew that in three years' time, she would encounter Mykeles and ruthlessly dispose of him. Understanding the future events, even Rose realized that Mykeles would grow close to her younger sister for the sake of the uprising, manipulating Rose Knight and seizing the throne, leading the empire to its downfall. She desired to thwart Mykeles in this endeavor, and to achieve that, it was imperative to keep these two individuals as far apart from each other as possible. Almost inadvertently, Sedella informed even Rose that many homunculi desired to offer their loyalty to her. Even Rose jestingly replied, suggesting she would take care of Sedella's happiness if she achieved success in the future. Sedella earnestly implored even Rose to choose a personal knight, but stumbled upon realizing that this conversation displeased the princess. Even Rose pacified her assistant. Recognizing that both she and Sedella had suffered due to their heritage and principles regarding family traditions. Even Rose's mother, an esteemed alchemist, had passed away early, and she herself was considered a half-blood. Like her mother, she cherished anything possessing consciousness and its own essence, sharing a humane attitude towards homunculi. However, advocating for better treatment of them in her past life only brought her more anguish. Sedella had assisted her in surviving the most challenging circumstances, and even Rose suspected that when she was held captive, Sedella had been cast out of the castle. 
Considering all this, even Rose turned to Sidella and declared her unwavering commitment to arranging and ensuring her well-being. She desired a tranquil existence where she could rectify many things within her power. With Mykeles residing in a floating prison, even Rose decided not to delay and promptly address this issue, aiming to avoid repeating past mistakes. The princess wanted to speak with her father as the ruler of the Helamid Empire who permitted polygamy, resulting in the emperor having 18 children. Each morning, a few heirs were randomly chosen for a special audience with their father. Even Rose hoped to be among those who would have an audience with the emperor. Even Rose inquired of her chambermaid about who would be going to their father that day. It was not the most pleasant company that would assemble, reminiscent of the past, when she found herself ensnared in the cunning trap of her sister, Bridget. Even Rose recalled that it was after that day that she fell completely out of favor with her father. Now, she contemplated how to outmaneuver the impending situation. To begin with, even Rose resolved that she would no longer be an ugly duckling and decided to adorn herself. She chose a vibrant and splendid gown and requested an appropriate hairstyle. She was determined not to fall short in elegance compared to the third princess, Bridget, or enchantment compared to the eighth princess, Rose Knight. Sedella, her chambermaid, contemplated how to strike the perfect balance, ensuring that even Rose would not be compared to the other princesses. Even Rose did not hinder Sedella from working on her appearance. She shared with her assistant her desire to become the crown princess, which meant they would both have to put in considerable effort. Persuading Sedella did not take long, as the enthusiastic girl immediately threw herself into the task. Even Rose requested her hair to be styled in a specific manner and adorned with a particular accessory. As Even Rose hurried toward the morning greeting, Rose Knight caught up with her and began conversing with a sweet smile. However, in that moment, all the memories associated with her younger sister rushed through Even Rose's mind. And they were far from pleasant. It was incredibly challenging for even Rose to contain herself while looking into the eyes of her murderer overwhelmed by the memories, she made a conscious decision to return to reality and not succumb to her emotions. Even Rose smiled at her younger sister and remarked that she was speechless upon witnessing her beauty. Rose Knight accepted the compliments, inadvertently noticing that even Rose had put considerable effort into her morning attire, which she duly conveyed to her sister. At that moment, a knight homunculus with silvery hair approached Rose Knight. Even Rose asked Rose Knight to introduce her to her companion. The young woman quickly shared his identity and emphasized that she had requested his escort to the main palace. Sylvestian, the knight, greeted Even Rose respectfully. Even Rose gazed at him and already understood that this time. She would not allow her sister to discard this person like a worn-out item. The seventh princess addressed Rosanite's companion and expressed that she had heard many good things about him. She knew him to be a talented knight skilled in both magic and fencing. Even Rose sincerely wished the young man to find a kind master to whom he would pledge his loyalty. Sylvestian was deeply moved by the princess's words, momentarily forgetting to thank her. He quickly apologized and corrected himself, stating that most of the imperial individuals were only interested in his hair color and nothing more. But it was time for the girls to conclude their conversations and hasten to the morning greeting with their father. The table was set, and all the invited guests were gathering for the appointed time. Two princes and Bridget were already seated at the table. The younger sisters entered the hall and curtsied to those present. The brothers immediately began praising Rosanite's beauty one after another, attempting as always to belittle even Rose by emphasizing her mixed blood. Her half-blood status was revealed by the color of her hair. All members of the imperial family had golden locks, while even Rose's hair was a shade of lime blonde. For some reason, this fact always saddened the young girl. However, she eventually calmed herself and internally tried to shift her focus to another topic. This time, even Rose succeeded in doing so. The young princess remained silent and simply smiled. Her brothers began to whisper among themselves, finding her behavior rather peculiar. But even Rose knew that her life would be different, and she strived to stick to her predetermined plan and thoughts. 
She prioritized the pressing issues at hand, which were Bridget and Rose Knight. At that moment, the emperor entered the hall. The head of the household took his seat at the table and inquired if everyone was well in their gathered company. He received affirmative responses, then the emperor summoned his children to join in a communal morning meal and requested the servants to bring tea. At that moment, even Rose stood up from her seat and informed her father that she had prepared the tea herself and now sought permission to treat everyone. Her sisters were taken aback, and the emperor inquired whether it was done specifically for him. Even Rose stated that it was her hobby and emphasized her confidence in the taste and exquisite aroma of the beverage. The young woman once again requested permission to indulge her illustrious father. The man accepted his daughter's proposal, and Sedella approached the emperor and filled his cup with hot tea. The gentleman inhaled the aroma of the beverage and immediately emphasized its delightful scent. Then, even Rose commented that it was a genuine rubles infused with lemon juice, known to alleviate headaches. The young woman added that she had noticed how the emperor often furrowed his brow, implying it could be related to his headaches. Therefore, she decided to prepare this tea. The father thanked his daughter for her special consideration towards him and confirmed that he had indeed been suffering from headaches lately. Despite even Rose hastily preparing the drink with the available ingredients, she assured the emperor that she approached the tea-making process with great care and had been learning to brew it since last week. Grateful, the father informed her that he could already feel the pains going away as the tea worked. One of the brothers decided to distinguish himself and stated that he only knew of one interest of even Rose, alchemy. However, now the sister had revealed another side of herself and showcased yet another talent. Even Rose expressed gratitude to her brother and added that the art of tea making resembled alchemy in some ways. The young woman began to explain that it starts with the careful selection of all the ingredients followed by precise measurements and blending in specific proportions, and only then can a marvelous beverage be prepared. Even Rose delicately emphasized that this talent had been passed down to her by her father. Bridget decided to interject and inserted a word, saying that even Rose was indeed a talented alchemist, reminiscent of herself in her youth. Upon hearing this statement, even Rose's sisters responded good-naturedly, emphasizing their resemblance to each other to the fullest extent. Meanwhile, each of the emperor's sons endeavored to understand the game their sister was playing. The emperor pondered that even Rose's reaction to Bridget's words was a manifestation of fear towards her sister. Chuckling, he expressed his observation. Bridget, too, smiled and remarked that she was pleased to have such a discerning sister. Then, one of the brothers reminded everyone that Rosanite's birthday was approaching, sparking a discussion about the arrival of a personal night for the young lady and the grand celebration associated with it. In turn, Rosanite expressed her concerns regarding the upcoming ceremony. The girl was troubled by her lack of talent in magic or alchemy, and therefore, she was unsure if she could conquer the night so gracefully. But her father reassured Rosanite saying that every member of the imperial family is capable of conquering at least one homunculus, regardless of their magical abilities. However, the girl couldn't be appeased and continued to express her concerns. While her father continued to comfort her, Rose Knight couldn't help but envy her sister, even Rose, who surely wouldn't be bothered by such problems. The topic of even Rose's disregard for the traditions of the imperial family and her refusal to choose a personal knight arose again at the table. Rose Knight was delighted that the conversation had shifted to this level. Her sister must have known that even Rose would continue to uphold her principles, which always saddened their father deeply. The emperor once again declared that he did not want to hear his daughter's justifications and strongly called even Rose stubborn, just like her mother. Suddenly, even Rose interrupted her father and informed him that she was ready to seize the opportunity given to her. The young woman stated that she had pondered deeply the previous night, reevaluated her views, and now understood that she needed a personal night. Her statement left everyone, including her father, stunned. When he sought clarification, she simply reaffirmed what she had previously said. The emperor was overjoyed and invited her to sit beside him so they could discuss the numerous unresolved matters face to face. 
her father began inquiring about her preferences regarding the date and other conditions of the ceremony. Even Rose asked for only one thing, for the ritual to take place without any elaborate formalities. Curious about her choice, the emperor asked which among the homunculi had caught her attention. Confidently, even Rose stated that her future personal knight should be none other than the monstrous denizen of the floating dungeon, Mykeles Agneto. When even Rose announced her desire to choose a personal knight, a commotion erupted in the hall. Her father requested silence, but the emperor's sons were unwilling to be appeased. One of the brothers vehemently objected, stating that Mykeles had been imprisoned because he refused to swear allegiance. He emphasized that not even the emperor could force him to submit. The young man couldn't comprehend why even Rose intended to conquer him. Yet, the young woman turned the situation to her advantage by highlighting how her choice underscored the weakness of the mighty father. This had its desired effect. After pondering for a moment, the emperor informed his daughter that Mykeles was a dangerous individual who had not yet undergone the selection ceremony. This meant that he had not yet become a true homunculus with absolute subservience to the imperial family. The father pointed out that due to his exceptional abilities, he had not been killed but instead punished with imprisonment in the floating prison. Even Rose understood that she was currently walking a fine line. Even the proposition to attempt to conquer such a homunculus like Mykeles could be turned against her as a challenge to the power of the imperial family. Even Rose addressed her father and proposed conducting a ceremony for the captive as a blessing from the emperor. She emphasized that the imperial family could not refuse such a gift. Her father pondered over her words and acknowledged their validity. Even Rose suddenly played her part and added that she couldn't comprehend how a pitiful homunculus could resist the authority of such a majestic individual. She speculated that the reason might lie in the depths of his mana flows. The emperor remained silent, lost in thought. The young woman could sense her father teetering on the edge of succumbing to her proposal. She further highlighted that this imprisoned individual was an exception confined in a prison until now, and she suggested resolving this matter by compelling him to serve the emperor as her personal knight. The emperor, closing his eyes, pondered and deliberated. Finally, he made his decision and proclaimed it. He considered fulfilling even Rose's request, however, he added that he would have one condition. Even Rose and Sedella set out for the training complex of the homunculi, situated in a polar region, a place unmarked on any map of the empire. Every year, approximately 100 newly created homunculi were sent there to undergo rigorous training and education for 15 years in preparation for their future service to the imperial family. Those who passed the examination attained the first rank and could serve as palace guards or personal knights. However, each and every one of them was merely expendable material for the imperial family. Not to mention the lower-ranking homunculi. Even Rose wondered how there had not yet been a rebellion. Meanwhile, the director of the training complex emerged to greet the guests and extend his welcome, introducing himself. He sought permission to accompany the young women to the floating prison. Now, they all ventured deeper into the towering cavern. While they walked, the overseer inquired if even Rose knew that the majority of homunculi that came into existence had dark-colored hair. However, during their time in the training complex, their hair color was bright and light due to the limiter used to prevent magic from flowing through the mana stream. This accessory caused their hair to lighten. The overseer pointed out that when the limiter was removed, their hair returned to its usual dark hue. Even Rose affirmed her knowledge of this. In that moment, she remembered Sylvestian. It was his hair color that garnered particular popularity. In response, the man smiled at the seventh princess and mentioned that he only learned of it after joining the training complex. In his eyes, this phenomenon was as mysterious and marvelous as the metamorphosis of insects. Such a comparison with homunculi did not sit well with even Rose. Finally, they arrived at their designated location. The overseer invited the girls to step onto a special platform to ascend to the hanging sill. When even Rose saw the captive, he had pink hair. Now, the girl understood why homunculi were often referred to as dolls. She gazed upon Mykeles. Even Rose did not expect to see him in such a state. 
The young man lifted his head and locked eyes with the princess. The overseer was incensed by the prisoner's behavior and intended to strike him for his disrespect towards a member of the imperial family. However, even Rose restrained his impulse. Instead, she approached closer herself, as she wished to speak with him personally. Suddenly, the princess requested to be left alone with him. Everyone departed, even said Ella. Even Rose gazed at Michaelis, now recalling their last encounter on the day before death. At that time, their circumstances were entirely reversed. The princess analyzed and compared both situations. Now, she could see that despite all the events of the past, Michaelis' gaze was filled with a peculiar hatred towards her. Even Rose remembered how, during their final meeting, the man had said that she should have chosen him, and now she was fulfilling his request. Even Rose desired to converse with Michaelis, and to accomplish this, she decided to set him free. When the young man regained his ability to speak, he inquired about the purpose of the princess's visit to this place. Even Rose introduced herself and informed him of the purpose of her visit. He was surprised that the seventh princess had come to make him her personal knight. Michaelis had heard that she adamantly refused to enlist the service of homunculi. The maiden confirmed his knowledge, stating that she currently required reinforcement of her position as an heir. Michaelis suggested that she find another servant for herself. Even Rose exclaimed and conveyed that she was not seeking his servitude. Then, in a hushed tone, she expressed that it was specifically him she needed, but not as a slave. Michaelis regarded the maiden's plea as a jest and was unwilling to remain a slave under any circumstance. Even Rose attempted to explain that she did not want to take a knight for the sole purpose of treating him as refuse. The princess confidently stated that she needed no one else but him. Then, even Rose added that only he could be her personal knight. This statement both impressed and bewildered Michaelis. He was curious as to why he was chosen for this role. Currently, the maiden couldn't provide an answer to this question, but she promised to be candid when he became her knight. Even Rose added that she could promise him all the respect she could offer from her side. The princess also pledged never to employ coercive force upon him to compel him to perform demeaning acts. Michaelis could not and did not want to believe the princess, knowing the absolute power of the magical contract. Then, even Rose simply requested trust from him. Inwardly, the man struggled. He could not make a decision. He wanted to believe the princess, yet at the same time, he understood that she was of imperial blood. He recalled how the ruler had tried to subjugate him and then, failing to succeed, imprisoned him. That was when Michaelis resolved that he would certainly not be a slave to the imperial order. But now, the man understood that all members of the ruling family were equal, and there was no good awaiting him in any relationship with them. The only way to leave this place was to become the very personal knight, and he desired to escape from the prison at any cost, even at the cost of subjugation. Thus, Michaelis requested the princess to take him away from this place. Even Rose freed the young man, and when he straightened up, he added that he had never intended to renounce his oath of allegiance to the emperor. He also proposed that the princess reconsider her decision. However, even Rose remained unwavering, and they proceeded with the ceremonial imprint of the imperial seal upon Michaelis. The ritual was arduous, and during the process, even Rose was losing a great deal of strength. She recalled her father's soul condition. The emperor had stated that if she failed to imprint the seal, she must kill Michaelis on the spot. Even Rose had no options left but to endure the pressure and exert all her might. At a certain moment, the man noticed a crack in one of the princess's ornaments. He recognized it as an alchemical crystal of amplification. Even Rose deliberately adorned herself with special hidden pieces. Today, they contained forbidden high-ranking artifacts left to her by her mother. Only they could aid her in such a situation. The ritual concluded, but now, something entirely incomprehensible was unfolding. Even Rose was falling off of the floating prison for some reason.